Good afternoon. My name is Katherine White, and I'm a member of the University of Michigan Board of Regents. And first, I would like to recognize our president of the University of Michigan, Mary Sue Coleman, who's here with us. And we also have two Regent Emeriti, uh, Phil Power and Neil Nielsen here with us today. So thank you. <clears throat> and so on behalf of the University of Michigan, I would like to welcome you all here this afternoon. It is a tremendous honor to have Federal Reserve Chairman Dr. Ben Bernanke as our featured speaker. Chairman Bernanke will be introduced more thoroughly uh, in a moment by today's host, uh, Dean Susan Collins, from the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. The first portion of our program will consist of a conversation between the dean and the chairman, and as such, let me take a moment to introduce Dean Collins to you. Dr. Collins is the Joan and Sanford Weil Dean of Public Policy and a professor of public policy and economics. The Ford School is one of the top public policy programs in the nation. The Ford School is known for its excellence, from its faculty that is outstanding, to its firm grounding in degree programs in social science research. And additionally, the Ford School has remarkably strong connections and affiliations with scholars, programs, and opportunities from all over the nation and the world. Dr. Collins' area of expertise is international economics, including issues in both macroeconomics and trade. She is currently a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings and vice president of the Association for Professional Schools of International Affairs. Just last month, Dr. Collins was appointed to the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago's Detroit branch and she joins a group of private sector leaders, scholars, and analysts whose responsibilities range from general supervision of the bank to making recommendations on monetary policy. And very importantly, Dean Collins and her colleagues continually share their understanding of our region's economic conditions to advise monetary policy. Her work on the board, and indeed today's event itself, are clear examples of the University of Michigan's strong commitment to helping our state and our region grapple with its urgent policy challenges. And now, to begin our program, let's welcome Dean Susan Collins to the stage to formally introduce Chairman Bernanke. Thank you very much, Regent White. It is also my great pleasure to welcome all of you here today. And on behalf of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, um, the University of Michigan is extremely honored to welcome the Honorable Ben Bernanke, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Today's conversation is the latest in our series of distinguished lectures, policy talks at the Ford School. We're so pleased that Regent White could introduce today's event, and we're also very pleased to have uh, President Mary Sue Coleman with us today, as well as Regent Emeritus Nielsen and Power, who were already mentioned to you. We also have several of the university's executive officers and deans, and I would like to welcome all of them and thank them for joining us today. Well, it's an honor and truly a personal pleasure for me to introduce our special guest. As the Central Bank of the United States, the Fed's charge is to promote a healthy economy and a stable financial system. This is a complex and critically important mission, and that makes the person at its helm one of, if not the most important, economic policymakers worldwide. Chairman Ben Bernanke was first appointed Fed Chair in 2006, and he has served in that role during the most challenging period for monetary and financial policy since the Great Depression. The financial crisis, the Great Recession, very slow recovery with persistently high unemployment, 
evolving global challenges, and the very contentious situation between Congress and administration, which continues to stymie fiscal policy. Chairman Bernanke was uniquely prepared for this extremely complicated role. As a highly respected economist, he taught at Harvard, MIT, and Stanford before joining Princeton's faculty. He had already served as a Fed governor and chaired the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He's an expert on the role of central banks, and he's renowned for his research on policy during the Great Depression, specifically how the Fed could have handled things better. In fact, in 2000, he wrote a paper entitled A Crash Course for Central Bankers, which was published in Foreign Policy. He has a deep and long-standing commitment as well to education, and I know he recently took time out to do a town hall meeting for K-12 through teachers. And so I'm particularly pleased today that joining us in the audience is an advanced placement economics class from Chelsea High School. A special welcome to you. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, a word about our format. For the first portion of our time, Dr. Bernanke will join me here on the stage in a conversation about a number of economic issues. For the rest of the time, he has graciously agreed to take questions from the audience, and so at around 4.30, our staff will be coming through the aisles to collect question cards from you. Those of you who are watching online, or even those of you in the audience, are uh, welcome to tweet your questions to us as well, using as a hashtag, Ford School Bernanke. Professors Catherine Dominguez and Justin Wolfers will select questions along with two of our graduate students, Hayden Allen and Kirby Smith. And now it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome to the stage Chairman Ben Bernanke. Susan, before we get started, I wanted just to take a minute to remember uh, Ned Gramlich, uh, who taught here at the University of Michigan for more than 20 years um, and was one of the first deans, if not the first dean, of the public policy, policy school here. I knew Ned as a uh, member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve in Washington. He was a terrific colleague. He was one of the first people to figure out the subprime issue, as you probably know. And uh, it, it was a great loss that when he passed a, a few years ago. So I just wanted to, uh, to say that and, and, and to thank you for inviting me here to Michigan. Well, thank you very much. Um, both we are delighted to have you here, but also for your special words about Ned Gramlich, who has played such an important role in the Ford School development. And uh, we're delighted to have you recognize that. Perhaps a good place for us to start our conversation is with something that I'm sure many in our audience have been paying close attention to in recent weeks, and that is the fiscal cliff. Uh, I actually believe that that's a term that you're credited with popularizing last February. You've stressed that uncertainty about fiscal policy is one of the real concerns that is slowing economic growth. Well, a deal was struck recently. What are your views of the outcome? Well, when you think about fiscal policy, there, there are a whole lot of issues, but I think the two big issues right now that we need to think about, first is the long-run sustainability of our debt. Um, as the Congressional Budget Office and a lot of other experts have shown, uh, if there's no change over the next couple of decades, uh, deficits will rise, debt to GDP ratios will rise, and our debt will become unsustainable. So a very, very important objective for policy is to find a plan to bring the federal budget under control over the next few decades. The second issue, though, which in some ways seems contradictory to the first, is that, as you know, we're still in a relatively uh, fragile recovery, and we want to avoid taking fiscal actions that will push the economy back into recession. And that was one of the risks that the fiscal cliff uh, posed, that if uh, tax increases and spending cuts of that size were all to occur, uh, in the short run, uh, the CBO and others uh, estimated that uh, unemployment would rise and we very well might go back into, um, into a recession. So the challenge is to uh, achieve long-run sustainability without uh, unduly hampering the, the recovery which we have. Now, the, um, 
the deal that was struck uh, together with um, the previous work uh, uh, in 2011 that involved some spending cuts made some progress in both of these goals. Um, on long-run sustainability, at least over the next decade or so, we have seen some movement towards stability in terms of the debt-GDP ratio, for example. More work to be done, for sure, a lot more work to be done over the longer period, um, but uh, some, some progress there. And then on the uh, uh, short run, uh, the fiscal cliff uh, deal on uh, New Year's um, eliminated a good bit of the restrictive components of the, of the fiscal policy that would have had such adverse effects. Again, not completely, but at least a, a good start. So, so there was a bit of progress on both of these two goals, um, uh, very importantly. But uh, I should hast hasten to say that we are not out of the woods because we are approaching a number of other fiscal uh, critical watersheds coming up. We've got um, uh, the uh, funding of the government. Uh, we've got the so-called sequester, which is uh, a, a set of automatic spending cuts that were delayed by two months as part of the fiscal cliff arrangement. And uh, we have the infamous debt ceiling, which will come into play. So we will be seeing a lot of activity in the next few months, uh, debates about the appropriate size of the government, about the size of the deficit, um, and a lot of uh, back and forth over these three issues. I think I just want to, uh, without going into all the different ramifications, I want to say one word about the debt ceiling, which is that not everybody understands what the debt ceiling is about. The debt ceiling, uh, raising the debt ceiling, which Congress has to do periodically, gives the government the ability to pay its existing bills. It doesn't create new deficits. It doesn't create new spending. Um, so not raising the, de the debt ceiling is sort of like a family uh, which is trying to improve its credit rating, saying, oh, I know how we can save money. We won't pay our credit card bills. Not the most effective way to improve your credit rating. And uh, it was the very slow um, solution to the debt ceiling in August 2011 that got the U.S. downgraded last time. So it's very, very important. Uh, all these issues are important, but it's very, very important that Congress uh, take necessary action to raise the debt ceiling um, to avoid a situation where our government doesn't pay its bills. Well, a number of people have expressed concern about how much of the challenges actually were addressed in the deal. As you've mentioned, it certainly went part way, but it leaves a number of issues still on the table, and additional negotiations are looming. Would you characterize that as an additional cliff that is facing us, or do you think that uh, it's not as concerning as it was when you raised that term initially? Well, as I said, the, the fiscal cliff, um, if it had allowed to take place, would have uh, probably created a recession uh, this year. Uh, a good bit of that has been addressed. But nevertheless, we still have, first, uh, a fairly restrictive set of uh, fiscal policies now. Um, it's estimated that um, federal fiscal policy will subtract from real GDP growth something on the order of one to one and a half percent this year, quite significant uh, drag on the economy. And at the same time, we have quite a bit to do to address our long-term sustainability issues. So there's a lot more work to do. Let me, let me be very clear about that. Um, but it's going to be a long haul. It's not going to happen you know, overnight. Basically because the government budget represents uh, the values and priorities of the, of the public and decisions being made about what to spend on, what to tax, and so on are very difficult and contentious decisions that are going to take some time to, uh, to address. Well, uh, those issues, of course, are not the specific purview of the Fed. And so uh, why don't we shift gears and talk more explicitly about some of the things that the Fed is doing and things that the Fed might do. Um, perhaps a, a way to introduce that is to say that the Fed, of course, has been keeping interest rates at close to zero since uh, roughly 2008. And it's dug pretty deep into its arsenal of very unconventional policies more recently in terms of, in particular, the very massive Asset Purchases uh, recently launched its third round, which are intended to bring long-term interest rates. Can you tell us how well you think that is working? 
So to go back just one step, um, as you said, uh, we've brought the short-term interest rate down almost to zero. And for many, many years, monetary policy just involved uh, moving the short-term, basically overnight interest rate up and down and, and hoping that the rest of the interest rates would, would move in sympathy. Um, then we hit a situation uh, in 2008 where we had brought the short-term rate down about as far as it could go, almost entirely to zero. And so the question is, what more could the Fed do? And there were many people a decade ago, there were a lot of uh, articles about how the Fed would be out of ammunition if it got the short-term rate down to zero. Um, but a lot of work uh, by academics and others, uh, researchers at uh, central banks, suggested there was more that could be done once you got the short-term rate down to zero. And in particular, what you could do is try to address uh, the longer-term interest rate, bring longer-term rates down. And there are two basic ways to do that. Uh, one way is through talk, communication, sometimes called open mouth operations. Uh, the idea being that if you tell the public that you're going to keep rates low in the long term, that that will have the effect of pushing down longer term interest rates. But with the question, the one you're asking about is what uh, we call at the Fed uh, large scale asset purchases, or otherwise known as QE. Uh, the idea there is that by buying large quantities of longer term treasury securities or um, mortgage-backed securities, that we can drive down the interest rates on those key securities, and that, in turn, um, uh, affects uh, spending investment uh, in the economy. Um, the latest episode, uh, you know, so far we think we are getting some uh, effect. Uh, it's kind of early. Um, but overall, uh, it's clear that through the three iterations that you referred to, that we have succeeded in bringing long-term rates down uh, pretty significantly, and uh, clear evidence of that would be uh, mortgage rates. As you know, the 30-year uh, mortgage rate is something like 3.4 percent now, incredibly low. And that, in turn, makes housing very affordable, and that, in turn, uh, is helping the housing sector recover, creating construction jobs, raising house prices, increasing um, uh, activity in that sector, real estate uh, activity, and so on. So I think, broadly speaking, that we have found this to be an effective tool. Um, but we're going to continue to assess how effective, uh, because it's possible that as you move through time and a situation changes, that the impact of these tools could vary. But um, I think what we have decisively shown is that the short-term interest rate getting down to zero, what economists call the zero lower bound problem, uh, does not mean the Fed is out of ammunition. There's still things we can do, things we have done. And I would add that uh, other central banks around the world have, have done similar things and have also had some success in, in uh, creating more monetary policy support for the economy. So you had mentioned that, of course, the, um, there's been evidence that the longer term interest rates, mortgage rates, had come down through the initial rounds. Um, a concern is that the unemployment rate remains very high and to further increase activity to try to bring that down, one would hope to see some additional movement from the most recent round. Um, are you suggesting that uh, one would need to be patient, or um, can you say a little bit more about how you would assess whether this most recent round is having the kind of effect that you would expect or anticipate? Well, as I said, we'll, we'll be doing that on a regular basis. Um, we'll be looking first at the impact on financial markets, and we do see some impact there. Uh, we'll be looking to see um, whether or not the uh, labor market situation is improving. Um, there has been some modest improvement. Um, when we first began talking about um, the uh, latest round, the unemployment rate was about 8.1, now it's about 7.8. There's been some movement, but we would obviously like to see a stronger labor market. Um, a labor market with uh, nearly 8% unemployment, with 40% uh, of the unemployed having been out of work for six months or more, that's not you know, that's not an acceptable situation. That's a situation where there's too many people uh, whose skills and talents are being wasted, who are um, suffering significant hardships. So we're looking to see uh, improvement uh, in the labor market and in the economy more broadly. So we'll continue to evaluate. I, I can't give you um, specific criteria except to say that we'll uh, be assessing the impact of our actions on financial market conditions. 
and looking to see how those link up to, um, uh, to developments in labor markets and in the broader economy. As always, you have to make assumptions. You have to think, ask yourself what would have happened if we hadn't taken these actions. Um, but again, um, the evidence seems to be, and I, I would cite not only evidence on the US, but also on the UK and, and elsewhere, that these uh, types of policies do have some impact on the economy. And at this point, of course, having reduced the short-term interest rate close to zero, we are looking for the tools that we can get to, um, to get better outcomes. So if, uh, so certainly, hopefully, there will be uh, more of an impact going forward to continue to bring the unemployment rate down more quickly. Um, you mentioned that you are looking at the kinds of tools that are available. Is there more in the Fed's toolkit that might have the kind of power to have additional effects? Well, first, on the pace of improvement, that's, that's an interesting question because um, the, uh, the pace of growth, of economic growth, uh, over the last few years, since the beginning of the recovery, has not been as strong as you normally would think would be needed to get really big improvements in the labor market. Nevertheless, uh, we have seen a, a decline in unemployment from 10 to 7.8, which is you know, fairly significant, and we hope to see uh, ongoing improvement there. Um, so it's a little bit hard to judge exactly how much more improvement we'll see, um, uh, but certainly we want things to keep things going in the right direction. In terms of additional tools, as I mentioned earlier, once you get the short-term interest rate down to zero, there's basically uh, two principal approaches, uh, either securities purchases um, or communication. There are a few other things that uh, are of smaller magnitude, like uh, the interest rate we pay on the excess reserves, for example. Um, but um, I think those are the two basic uh, approaches that we have. Of course, we can continue to try to uh, improve our communication, um, look for ways to be more effective, but there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no completely new uh, method that we haven't yet uh, tapped. Um, we have uh, just had a meeting of the Detroit Board of the mm -hmm. um, Board of Directors of the Chicago Fed, as you know, which provides some information about the conditions more explicitly in this region, and certainly uh, the conditions across the country are quite varied. And I wonder if you could share how you factor in the differences um, across different parts of the economy when making decisions that, of course, are uh, more aggregate. Well, first, uh, thank you, Dean Collins, for joining the Detroit branch. Um, uh, people probably don't know, unless you have been studying this, but um, every Federal Reserve Bank around the country, the 12 reserve banks and, and uh, a good number of additional branches, um, each one has a, a board of directors drawn from the private sector. It could be uh, academics, it could be business people, it could be community leaders, um, nonprofit uh, um, organizers, and so on. And we draw these people in primarily to get their input and their insight. Um, this is a very large and complex economy. Uh, there are many different sectors. Um, and it's very helpful to us to have people from leaders from different parts of the economy, from different parts of the country, providing this input and giving us somebody to bounce ideas off of uh, to help us uh, make a better decisions and understand what's going on. So that's. That's very useful, and uh, I, I attended the, uh, at least part of the meeting this morning uh, with the Detroit branch, and I heard from a number of people about uh, the auto industry, healthcare, uh, academics, uh, industry, a variety of things. So that's, that's, that's actually very useful. Now, um, in terms of uh, the local economy, um, you know, Michigan is still, uh, notwithstanding that it's become much more diversified, it still has a pretty significant reliance on auto production. And because auto sales dropped so sharply during the Great Recession, um, the unemployment rate here rose, I think, like to 15% or something like that, compared to a 10% uh, national peak. It's now come back quite a bit as the auto industry has improved. And so we are seeing, uh, I think, some strengthening, although conditions here are still not where we'd like them to be. Housing market also, I think, has come back some uh, in Michigan. But like many other uh, industrial parts of the, of the country, like Pittsburgh Steel 
plants and other places. Um, Michigan also is diversifying and is bringing in uh, high tech, uh, various kinds of services, healthcare, education, and so on. And places like the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, are a tremendous resource for entrepreneurs, uh, people trying to develop new high tech, uh, high tech uh, uh, businesses. So it is a good sign to see that America still has a powerful industrial base, but it is diversifying into a wide range of, of new types of industries. Um, so it is a large and complex economy. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk about the broader economy or not, but we can come back to it if you like. But um, uh, the, uh, you know, we have been seeing some improvement in the labor market. It's still not where we'd like it to be. Um, growth has been moderate. There are some positive signs to look at, and I think one of the key positives I already made reference to is housing. Uh, as you know, house prices in the U.S. fell about 30 percent, and the uh, amount of construction fell extraordinarily uh, over this recession. Um, and now, for the first time, really since uh, 2007, 2006, uh, we're starting to see increases in production, high rising house prices. That's going to affect household wealth. So that's, that's one positive factor that's going to help us uh, have, a, I hope, a better year in 2013 and then in 2014. Uh, a few other things that are positive, uh, just to point out. One is that um, state and local governments, which uh, have been in very contractionary mode because of the loss of tax revenue during the, during the recession, been laying off people, have been postponing spending, um, they're in much better shape now than they were a few years ago, including in Michigan, I think. And uh, as a result, they're not going to be the drag on the economy that they've been for the last few years. Energy, you know, the energy industry in the U.S. is, is looking much stronger. Um, consumers are, 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 are more optimistic. The uh, University of Michigan publishes the Index of Consumer Sentiment, which is one of the very best uh, guides to how consumers are feeling. And uh, as long as the fiscal policy thing isn't getting too, uh, uh, too messed up, the uh, uh, consumers seem to be a little bit more uh, upbeat. So there are some positives, um, but I want to be clear that um, while we've made some progress, that it's still quite a ways to go before we're where we'd be satisfied. Well, let me shift gears a little bit. Certainly, as you well know, uh, there are some very vocal critics of Fed policy. And I wonder what you might say to those who argue that, for example, the policy that has maintained interest rates at such low levels has actually taken some of the pressure off of Congress to try to address these fiscal challenges, and that the, the massive asset purchases have created uh, extremely high risks, perhaps underappreciated risks for future inflation. Well, they're critics on both sides, you know. You should, you should give the other guys a chance. Uh, I'll get there. You'll get to them later. Okay. I'll get there later. Um, well, let me first say that as we think about uh, the costs and risks of, of any policy, we should also think about what we're trying to accomplish. And I, I made reference already, but the, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate from the Congress to achieve, or at least to try to achieve, price stability and maximum employment. Price stability means low inflation. We have basically taken that to mean 2% inflation. Uh, inflation has been very low. It's been below 2% um, and uh, appears to be on track to stay below 2%. So our price stability record is, is very good. Uh, unemployment, though, as we've already discussed, is uh, still quite high. Uh, it's been coming down, but very slowly, and uh, the cost of that is enormous in terms of uh, lost, um, you know, lost resources, um, hardship, uh, talents, and skills being wasted. Um, so our effort to try to create um, more strength in the economy to try and put more people back to work. I think that's an extraordinarily important thing for us to be doing. And uh, I think it motivates and, and justifies what has been, uh, agree, uh, I agree, a, uh, an aggressive monetary policy. So that's what we're doing, and that's why we're doing it. Now, are there 
downsides? Are there potential costs and risks? There are some. Um, you mentioned inflation. Uh, we have obviously used a very expansionary monetary policy. We've increased the monetary base, which is the amount of reserves that banks hold with the Fed. There are some people who uh, think that's going to be inflationary. Personally, I don't see much evidence of that. Um, uh, inflation, as I mentioned, has been quite low. Um, inflation expectations remain quite well anchored. Private sector forecasters do not see any inflation coming up. And in particular, uh, we have I believe we have all the tools we need to uh, undo our monetary policy stimulus and to, uh, to, to take that away before inflation becomes a problem. So I, I, I don't believe that uh, significant inflation is, is going to be a result of any of this. Um, that being said, uh, price stability is one part of our dual mandate. And we will be paying very close attention to make sure that inflation uh, stays uh, well contained as it is today. Um, the second issue I think would probably worth mentioning is uh, financial stability. Um, this is a difficult issue. Uh, the concern is, has been raised that by keeping interest rates very low, that we induce, the Federal Reserve induces people to uh, take greater risks um, in their financial investments. And that, in turn, could lead to uh, instability later on. Uh, again, a difficult question. Um, I probably could take the rest of the hour talking about it, so I don't think I'll do that. But what I will say is that um, we are, first of all, uh, very uh, engaged in, in monitoring uh, the economy and the financial system. Uh, the Fed has increased enormously the amount of resources we put into uh, monitoring financial conditions and trying to understand what's happening in different sectors of the financial markets. Um, we have also, of course, been part of the very extended effort to strengthen our financial system by increasing capital in banks, by making derivatives transactions more transparent, um, by toughening supervision, and so on. So we are taking measures to try both to prevent uh, financial stability and to identify potential risks that we would then address uh, through regulatory or supervisory methods. So we're very, very much attuned to, those, to these issues. But once again, I think this is something that we need to pay careful attention to. And um, as, I, uh, as we discussed in our uh, statement and have uh, for a while, um, as we evaluate these policies, we're going to be looking at the benefits, which uh, I believe involve some help to economic growth, to reduction in unemployment, but we're also going to be looking at costs and risks. We have a cost-benefit type of approach here, and we want to make sure that the actions we're taking are fully justified in a cost-benefit type of framework. Now, you mentioned, I, I didn't talk about the congressional issue. Um, you know, I think that, you know, it, it's not really up to the Fed to try to be playing games to try to induce Congress to do what it's supposed to be doing. Congress needs to be addressing these fiscal issues. And uh, interest rates will eventually rise. We hope they'll rise because that means the economy will be, economy will be strengthening. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to be playing games with that. We, 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 we are going to follow our mandate, which means do what's necessary to help the economy be strong. Congress should take care of their job, which is to address uh, the fiscal issues, which I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, I don't think that small changes in interest rates are really going to make that much difference. Indeed, I think the worst thing we could do would be if we raised interest rates prematurely and caused a recession, that would greatly increase budget deficits and would just make the solution to the problem all that much more difficult. So I, I don't see that... Uh, raising interest rates in order to force Congress to take uh, action on a fiscal policy is a very sensible, sensible way to go. Well, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, you came to your position with a uh, real expertise as one of the world's experts on the Great Depression and how policymakers should react in the midst of a crisis. Um, now that you have actually lived through a major global crisis, I wonder if you could tell us what surprised you most. The crisis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I was, I, I was very engaged, very interested in um, financial crises. As, a, as an academic, I worked on the Great Depression. Um, uh, I, I did theoretical work on the role of financial crises in, in, in the macro economy. And I was very interested when I came to the Fed in, in addressing issues related to potential crises. But obviously, you know, we, this was a very large and complex uh, crisis that uh, was more severe than I anticipated, certainly. Um, and I think it'd be fair to say than most people anticipated. But um, we did learn some things from history, and, and uh, I think there's a lot of value to studying history, particularly from our perspective, economic history, because it helps you um, see what your predecessors did wrong and did right. Um, two things we learned from the Great Depression. One was uh, not to let monetary policy get too tight. Uh, in the 30s, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, did not actively try to expand uh, monetary policy accommodation. And as a result, there was a deflation, about 10% a year deflation, falling prices, very damaging. Um, the Fed also did not do very much in the 30s to try to stabilize the banking system, which, you know, about, about a third of all the banks in the country uh, failed. Um, so those were two lessons that we really tried to uh, learn from. We, of course, were, have been, as we've been discussing, very aggressive on the monetary policy side. And we took strong actions to try to stabilize our financial system because we understood that um, if the financial system collapses, then the economy is likely to collapse as well. So we took those, those actions learning from, um, from what had happened in the 30s. A, a couple other things I think that were useful. Uh, during the 30s, in part because obviously the world was um, still recovering from World War I, there was a lot of uh, international uh, enmity, um, cooperation among central banks, among governments, was not very good. In fact, you may know about, your audience may know about the Smoot-Hawley tariff and the tariff wars and all the other things that happened during the 30s. Um, it's very important, if you can, in a global crisis like this one, to, um, uh, to cooperate, to coordinate as much as possible with policymakers around the world. And that was something that we, we did quite actively, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, banking and financial regulation stabilization, and even to some extent in monetary policy, when at one, on one date, uh, five or six of the world's largest, uh, most important central banks coordinated on an interest rate cut. Uh, we've also worked with other central banks in making sure, that, for example, that um, they have enough dollars uh, to lend in, for banks that need to use dollars in their transactions. So um, cooperation uh, has been very helpful in, in, in the latest episode, and uh, that was another thing that um, uh, we learned from the 30s. One last thing that occurs to me. Um, one reason that the Fed and other policymakers didn't uh, take more uh, aggressive fundamental action to um, to try to end the Great Depression was they were afraid to do anything that was unorthodox. There was the gold standard, there was a whole variety of, of standard practices, and given the great uncertainties that they faced, and I'm, I'm not being critical because it was an incredibly difficult uh, period, um, they often uh, maintained a very uh, orthodox approach. Um, the person who changed that in the United States was President Roosevelt, who did a lot of different things, you know, many, some of which didn't work, some of which did work. Uh, but uh, sometimes when you're in a very severe situation, you need to consider uh, unorthodox approaches. And the Fed and other central banks uh, did undertake some, uh, some unorthodox policies, which not all of them worked, but a lot of them did. And um, we did help to stabilize the global financial system and begin a process still underway of bringing our economy back to where we'd like to see it. Well, you raised the issue of what's going on globally and the cooperation that has emerged, which certainly is a, a very positive thing. Um, but of course, those global linkages are very important in terms of prospects for U.S. growth. Um, and if you look in the, over the medium term, um, 
where would you see a kind of plausible scenario to generate the demand for the growth that we hope the U.S. is able to achieve? Um, we aren't eager, I think, you would agree, to go back to the very high household consumption levels that were arguably unsustainable. Uh, given the challenges in Europe and slowing growth in China, it's not so clear where that growth might come from. And I wonder what your thoughts are about, uh, about that set of concerns. Well, it's, it's true that uh, global growth has been somewhat slower. Um, for a ver variety of reasons, different reasons. Um, one is the European situation, which you alluded to. Uh, Europe, much of Europe is in, is in recession at this point, following the very difficult uh, financial problems that they've had. Um, some emerging market economies have slowed for, again, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the slowdown in China uh, was at least partly um, uh, a policy goal to try to create a more sustainable and stable growth path and to try to shift the um, uh, sources of demand in China from uh, foreign buyers, uh, exports, to domestic, uh, domestic demand. So uh, a variety of things have happened to slow overall growth, and we saw in the US, uh, just the last reading, we saw pretty weak export numbers, and that's, for us, that's, uh, that's a loss of, again, potential growth from our perspective. So there are a couple of challenges. One, globally, uh, the different parts of the world that are facing slowdowns, each has to address its own set of uh, issues. In Europe, there's some progress has been made in addressing their um, uh, sovereign debt and banking issues that they have. Um, you know, the uh, European Central Bank has taken some important steps to try to stabilize the financial markets there, have been helpful. Um, they're working on improving their fiscal arrangements, uh, both to create longer-term sustainability in individual countries, but also to put up uh, a set of agreements uh, under which countries will be willing to work with each other on fiscal matters. Uh, they are working to develop a banking union where bank regulation would take, uh, be done throughout the Eurozone by the ECB or some other agency. Um, and that would strengthen the European banking system and make it less dependent on individual countries. So steps are being taken in Europe, which I hope will uh, help stabilize that situation over time. Um, in the emerging markets, again, you have a variety of different stories. But I think the, the fundamentals there in, in the emerging markets are, are pretty good, as you know. And even if there is some moderation of growth in some, uh, in some countries, the uh, we are seeing uh, overall a rather remarkable transformation of uh, places like China and India, uh, which has been the biggest anti-poverty program in history. Uh, the growth in those countries has, has lifted many millions of uh, people uh, out of poverty. So I think the growth uh, will proceed in, in those areas as well. With each country, each region, Latin America, Asia, uh, dealing with different sets of issues. Well, I know that our uh, audience has many questions to pose to you. Um, perhaps let me ask one final one before I turn over to our students to read questions from the audience. And that is given all of the range of things that we have already discussed, is there, are there one or two particular things that keep you up at night? <laughs> um. Well, we have a dog about this big that sleeps with us. <laughs> I tried to get as much sleep as possible. I think that's uh, probably good. Um, it, didn't, it didn't work out this today because the airline canceled, and it's a long story. But um, um, no, I, I uh, you know, I, I want to see our economy recover. I, I, I'd like to see this. Uh, uh, I'd like to see a stronger labor market. I'd like to see fiscal policy um, address the, the, the issues that I mentioned. There are a lot of obviously difficult issues out there, but I, I do think things are moving, you know, not as fast as we would like, but in the right direction. And um, I'm therefore cautiously optimistic about uh, the next couple of years. Thank you. Let me.
Well, as I mentioned, I'm sure that there are a great many questions that have already been shared with our presenters, so let me turn the floor to them. Thank you for your comments, Chairman Bernanke, and for your questions, Dean Collins. Um, my name is Kirby Smith, and I'm a master's student at the Ford School of Public Policy and the Ross School of Business. And the first audience question is that if Treasury had printed or minted a trillion dollar platinum coin, <laughs> would the Fed have accepted it and credited Treasury's account? If not, why not? And what does this mean for the independence of the Fed moving forward? Well, as you, I'm not gonna give that any oxygen. Um, as, you, as you probably know, the, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve over the weekend, the Treasury issued a statement which the Federal Reserve approved, uh, stating that um, we didn't think this was the right way to deal with this problem. I mean, there are, there are legal issues, there are policy issues. Um, I think the right way to deal with this problem, as I said earlier, is for Congress to do what it's supposed to do and needs to do and authorize an increase in the debt ceiling so that we can pay our debts, we can pay our bills. And that's the right way to do it. And, and uh, you know, I think that's what will eventually happen. But I don't think that going off in that other direction would, would really be all that helpful. Hello, Chairman Benecki. My name is Haven Allen. I am a second year MPP at the Ford School and also studying for a graduate certificate in science and technology. Uh, second question for the audience. Does the debt stealing still have a practical purpose, and could it be eliminated without much consequence? Does what have? The debt ceiling. Oh. Uh, no, it doesn't really have. You know, it's, it's, it's got symbolic value, I guess, but um, what no other country, I believe, and maybe the one or two other countries, but I think essentially no other countries in the world have this particular institution. Just so everybody understands what it is, the, the Congress appropriates $100, tells the government to spend $100 on whatever, and then it raises $80 in revenue uh, through its tax code. Now, there's arithmetic here. So it says, you know, uh, you gotta borrow $20, right? No, the, the Congress has to give a third rule which says that 100 minus 80 equals 20. Um, there really is, I mean, if the, if the Congress is approving spending and it's approving taxing and those two things are not equal, then it's kind of logically that there's got to be something to make up the difference and that difference is, is borrowing. Now, I'm not saying that deficits and debts are a good thing. I'm not saying that at all. But the way to address it is by having a sensible plan for spending and a sensible plan for revenue uh, and make decisions about how big the government should be or how small it should be. Um, but uh, again, as I was saying before, this is sort of like a family saying, well, we're spending too much, let's stop paying our credit card bill. That's not the, that's not the way to get yourself into good financial condition. So yes, I think um, uh, it would be a good thing to get, if we didn't have it. I don't think that's going to happen, and I think it's going to be around. But I, I, I do hope that uh, Congress will allow the government to pay its bills, not raise the possibility of default which would be very, very costly to our economy, um, and, and then address very seriously these fiscal issues. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, absolutely. There are a lot of important issues and very basic fundamental uh, values involved. Um, so let's do that, but uh, we don't need to do it in the context of uh, the debt ceiling. So do you believe that the Fed should actively prevent future asset bubbles? And if so, what tools do you have to do that? Well, asset bubbles, I mean, no, they're very, very difficult um, to, to uh, anticipate, obviously. Uh, but we can do some things. Uh, first of all, um, we can try to strengthen our financial system, um, say, by increasing, as I mentioned earlier, by increasing the amount of capital and liquidity that banks hold, by improving the supervision of those, of those banks, by making sure that every important financial institution is supervised by somebody. There were some very important ones during the crisis that essentially had no effective supervision. So if you make the system stronger, then if a, if a bubble or a, some other financial problem emerges, the system will be better able to, to, to uh, be more resilient. It'll be better able to, uh, to survive the, the problem. Now, 
you can try to identify bubbles, and I think um, uh, there's been a lot of research on that, a lot of thinking about that. We have created a, um, a council called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, which is made up of uh, 10 regulators and chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury, um, one of whose responsibilities is to monitor the financial system, as the Fed also does, and try to identify problems that, um, uh, that emerge. Um, so you're not going to identify every possible problem for sure, but you can, you, can, you can do your best and you can try to make sure the system is strong. And when you identify problems, um, you can use, I think the first line of defense needs to be regulatory and supervisory authorities that not only the Fed, but other um, organizations like the OCC and the FDIC and so on have as well. So you can address these problems using uh, regulatory and supervisory authorities. Now, having said all that, um, as I was saying earlier, um, there's a lot of disagreement about what role monetary policy plays in creating asset bubbles. It is not a settled issue. Um, there are some people who think that it's an important source of asset bubbles, others who think it's not. Our attitude is that we need to be open-minded about it and to pay close attention to what's happening. And to the extent that we can identify problems, you know, we, we need to address that. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, was created in uh, about 100 years ago now, uh, 1913 was the, uh, was the law, um, not to do monetary policy, but rather to address financial panics. Uh, and that's what we did, of course, in 2008 and 2009. And it's a difficult task, but I think going forward, the Fed needs to think about financial stability and monetary economic stability as being, in some sense, the two, the two key pillars of uh, what the central bank tries to do. And so we will obviously be working very hard on financial stability. We'll be using our regulatory and supervisory powers. We'll be trying to strengthen the financial system. And if necessary, we will adjust monetary policy as well. But I don't think that's the first line of defense. OK. Uh, this question comes from Twitter. Since the Fed declared it was targeting a 2% targeting a inflation rate in January of 2012, the FOMO, FOMC has released its projections five times. In each one of these projections, the inflation rate has come in below this target. Why then has the policy been set to consistently undershoot the target? Was that 140 characters? <laughs> I suspect many in our audience had uh, uh -huh. related questions. <laughs> yeah. um, well, that's a very good. It's a very good question, and when we've when we've uh, tried to address, as I as I said um, earlier, when Dean Collins was asking me about the um, uh, about the risks of some of our policies, um, I was pointing out that inflation is very low. Indeed, it's below the two percent target, and unemployment is above where it should be, and therefore there seems to be a pretty strong presumption that um, uh, we should be aggressive in monetary policy. So, you know, I think that that does make the case for being aggressive, which we are trying to do. Now, um, the additional point that I made, though, was that, um, you know, the short-term interest rate is close to zero, and therefore we are now in the world of non-standard monetary policies. We are asset purchases and communications and so on. And, and as we were discussing earlier, we have to pay very close attention to the costs and the risks and the efficacy of these non-standard policies, as well as the potential economic benefits. And to the extent that there are costs or risks associated with non-standard policies, which do not appear, or at least not to the same degree, for standard policies, then you would you know, economics tells you when something is more costly, you do a little bit less of it. Um, we are being quite uh, accommodative. We are working very hard to try to um, strengthen the economy. Uh, inflation is very close to the target. It's not radically far from the target. Um, but in trying to think about what the right policy is, we have to think not only about uh, the macroeconomic outlook, which is obviously very critical, uh, but also the costs and risks associated with the individual policies that we might, uh, we might apply. So I'd like to 
actually like to follow up on that question a little bit. Um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, which is in the toolkit and which you have been um, trying to use in a variety of ways is the way that the Fed explains its policy to the public. Um, first, there was a number of announcements that set dates for how long interest rates would remain low. More mm -hmm. recently, the move to making it conditional on performance. Um, and a variety of changes such as more information in the minutes about the kind of information or the kind of discussion that has happened at the Fed. And, and I wonder whether that increased information about what the Fed's thinking you see is helping to be more effective or uh, perhaps being uh, complicating the message to some degree. Well, of course, that's up to some extent in the up to the auditors, the beholders, to determine whether they think it's helpful or not. Um, but I think that to, to, to address your specific point, that switching from the date, you know, when we started out by trying to get, convey to the markets when we thought, you know, uh, short-term interest rates might start to rise, initially we, we gave a date, uh, which was just our best guess. And as conditions changed, we, we changed that date a couple of times. Um, a better way to do it, in my view, is instead of talking about a date, which is a very non-transparent way to explain what you're doing, people say, well, how did they get that date? What, 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 is it, uh, what does it mean? Instead, what we've tried to do in our more, more recent um, uh, evolution is to try to explain what we will be looking for in terms of unemployment and inflation, our two main uh, mandate objectives, uh, before we would begin the process of raising interest rates. Um, so that is, first of all, much more transparent. It helps people understand what our thinking is and what we're looking at. But also, uh, if the outlook changes, suppose, for example, that some really good news comes in, I, I hope it does, some really good news comes in about unemployment. Uh, if we were using the date, people wouldn't know how to adjust that. I mean, what, how do we change that? Is the date still valid or not? But if we're using these um, guideposts in terms of inflation and unemployment, then the um, uh, investors in the market can say, well, um, the date where we get to 6.5% unemployment it seems to be a little closer now than we thought, and that would allow us to change our estimate of when the Fed is going to respond. So that should allow a greater clarity about, uh, about how policy will evolve over time. Um, and that's our goal. I mean, we have uh, worked as a committee. We have, it's not easy to work with 19 people, all who have very strong opinions. Uh, but over time, we have tried to increase our clarity and tried to communicate more clearly. And um, each individual change can be debated, but I think if you look at the broad sweep of what we've accomplished in the last 15 years or so at the Federal Reserve in terms of communication, there's just been an enormous change. And uh, we are just much, much more uh, transparent and um, easy to understand, I think, than, than would have been the case uh, 15, 20 years ago. So the shift from Fed speak to uh, talking about fiscal cliffs is really quite striking. Um, mm -hmm. So this question is from an audience member. What's one aspect of financial policy that you think requires reform, but which isn't currently being discussed in the media? Well, I think the, the main area that has been put aside for the time being is, uh, is the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac, uh, which were taken into receivership um, at the very beginning of the crisis because of the losses that they suffered on, on mortgages and because of their low levels of capital. Um, I think there's a pretty widespread agreement in Washington that reform is needed uh, for those institutions. Um, and the Treasury has put out some alternative suggestions. Uh, other suggestions have been made by members of Congress. But um, so far, not too much progress has been made in that area. And I think that's, that's one pretty obvious area that needs to be addressed. But, um, I would say that you know the, the, the bill, the Dodd-Frank bill, of course, is very broad and has covered a lot of the major 
uh, uh, parts of the, of the financial system. This question comes from an audience member. How do you respond to the people who question the constitutionality of the Federal Reserve and would like to severely weaken it? And furthermore, how do you respond to members of Congress who wish to audit the Fed? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so um, I, do, I, I do know Article 1, sec never mind. Um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, the Fed has been around now for a century, and nobody so far has uh, had a Supreme Court case, so I'm not going to get into that uh, issue. I think the Fed um, performs the critical role of managing the monetary system, which is, of course, a, a power that Congress has to, to delegate, which it has done. Let me talk to the other issue, which is, I think, more... Um, more substantive. Um, as you know, there, there are bills uh, in Congress uh, that would, quote, audit the Fed. And um, it sounds like something, how could anybody object to auditing the Fed? I mean, don't you have to look at people's books and see what's on their books? Well, the trouble with audit the Fed is that that's not what it's about. It's a misnomer. The Fed's books are thoroughly and completely audited. We are audited first by an outside private sector accounting firm, which gives us a clean bill of health. Secondly, all of our books, all of our financials, everything is open to the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, which is, you know, works for Congress and for the government and can look at anything it wants to look at. Uh, and third, we also have an independent inspector general uh, that is able to, you know, evaluate any aspect of, of uh, the Fed's uh, financials or activities that it, it would like. Um, if you'd like to see more about this, the Fed's website, federalreserve.gov, has a detailed discussion of all the various audits that um, the Federal Reserve goes to. So all our financials, all of our activities are, are thoroughly audited um, with, with one exception, and that exception is that in the law which um, created the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, there is an exception made for monetary policy. In other words, the GAO can do anything it wants at the Federal Reserve, but what it can't do is go in and um, audit a monetary policy decision. Now, what the Audit the Fed bill would do is very simple. It would strike that clause. So if the Audit the Fed bill passed, then a congressman who didn't like the Fed's latest interest rate move could say, GAO, go audit that. And what that would mean would be, would be the Government Accountability Office would send its staff into the Federal Reserve to look and see, you know, why did you guys raise interest rates and, and begin to investigate that decision. And I, it seems to me that's the first step toward basically the Federal Reserve no longer being an independent central bank. Now, there's a very strong agreement around the world that if you want uh, monetary policy made based on long-term considerations and not based on short-term political considerations, and the central bank needs to have some independence in making monetary policy, what this bill would do is strike at the very heart of that independence. So it's my opinion that many people who support the bill just think it means what it sounds like, which is something about the financials. It has nothing to do with the financials. It has to do with whether or not Congress can uh, ask the GAO to um, uh, investigate a decision by the Fed that it doesn't like. And again, I think if you want a healthy economy, um, you want to have a, a strong and independent central bank, and that is not consistent with that, uh, with that bill. Um, this is the last question, and it comes from Twitter. So there's a vibrant discussion of macroeconomic issues on social media. Do you get any information from these discussions? And if so, how? Um, well, you know, uh, I read blogs. Um, I, I, I have to say the 140 characters kind of limits the discussion on the, <laughs> on the Twitter. Um, so those, uh, I mean, I think, the, I think blogs have become a pretty important um, a source of uh, intellectual exchange. Um, the same way, there was a very important step, Dean Collins will remember this, it used to be that uh, years ago, way long time ago, um, if you were an academic and you wrote a paper, 
then you had to submit it to a journal and it took two years and it got published and you know, it was like three years after you wrote the paper before anybody knew what you were working on. And then came uh, the internet and working papers and so on and pretty soon you know, papers were available almost immediately uh, for uh, professional uh, evaluation. But even that, of course, involved uh, the long delay involved in doing the research and writing the paper and, and so on. Um, what if you had a shorter uh, perspective, a shorter idea that you wanted to put out there? Well, again, the internet has provided um, uh, useful ways for people to communicate, uh, to uh, discuss um, interesting ideas in monetary policy or anything else. Um, I follow a lot of baseball blogs myself, actually. Uh, um, so uh, that's just the, the next natural step to creating a conversation among people. And I, you know, I think that's, uh, that's been very constructive. So um, there are a few Federal Reserve blogs. Uh, the Atlanta Fed has one. The New York Fed uh, has one. And uh, we have Twitter. We have Facebook. We're really moving along here. There we go. Uh, so um, uh, we're still a little bit old-fashioned. But, but the, uh, I think the social media uh, do provide a really convenient way to um, communicate quickly to a group of people, to exchange ideas, and uh, to keep track of what's going on in a particular area. So, you know, um, I, think, uh, I think there's some positive developments there. Well, perhaps we should encourage you to follow the tigers while you're uh, following. Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I'd like to thank our questioners for uh, posing the questions. I'd like to thank all of you in the room and online for joining us in today's conversation. You can find information on future policy talks at the Ford School on our website and through our Twitter site, and I hope you'll follow us. We certainly are, will be following the Fed. Um, Chairman, thank you very much for joining us today. We are <laughs> filled.